Welcome to the Rerooted Podcast with Francesca Maxime, trauma-sensitive mindfulness meditation teacher and poet. Together, we'll take a closer look at approaches to transforming trauma with insights from psychology, neuroscience, spirituality, social justice, and the creative arts. Join Francesca and her guests for an exploration of our shared connection and how we can cultivate greater compassion for ourselves and for others. If you'd like to support Francesca and the Rerooted Podcast, please visit BeHereNowNetwork.com forward slash Francesca. Hi, everybody. I'm Francesca Maxime, and I am so thrilled thrilled. that you are here joining us today for a extra special episode with one of my foundational teachers, um, the father of somatic experiencing, uh, Dr. Peter Levine. He received his PhD in medical biophysics from the University of California in Berkeley and holds a doctorate in psychology from International University. He's worked in the field of stress and trauma for over 40 years and is the developer, as I mentioned, of the somatic experiencing method, which I just became a somatic experiencing practitioner completely. He is the author of the very well-known bestseller, Waking the Tiger, Healing Trauma in Multiple Languages, uh, also in An Unspoken Voice, How the Body Restores, Releases Trauma and Restores Goodness, and then the latest, Trauma and Memory, Brain and Body in a Search for the Living Past. And I love the second part of it, In Search for the Living Past. Dr. Levine, thank you so much for joining me today. On- Hi. Hi. So... I was thinking today, um, as we look into um, your body of work, and uh, people can, of course, read more about you, and I'll share your information and websites, um, but I wanted to really just kind of get to it. Um, This latest book, Trauma and Memory, you're talking about our sort of emotional brain, if you will, our limbic brain is sometimes called in a triune brain system, which some people have different terminology about, but Can we talk a little bit about what explicit memory is, I call it sort of the autobiography, and what limbic memory or emotional memory is, kind of the memoir of our experience, and how this influences us in our lives and relates to trauma? Well, okay, Um, let me me kind of broaden that a little bit. Yeah. And let's talk some uh, fundamentals of memory. There are two basic forms of memory, explicit and implicit, explicit, conscious, implicit, I won't say unconscious, but at a much deeper level. And within each of those main categories, explicit and implicit, there are two subcategories. You have declarative memory, an explicit declarative memory, and something that's called autobiographical memory, or, uh, and uh, uh, the, they're, they're very different, even those two memories. So declarative memory means I re- remember that I have to get here, I have to set my computer up and do an interview with you uh, at 10.30 on the 22nd of February. That's all declarative memory. And of course we need it. Uh, otherwise we wouldn't have all of the great modern things that we have without declarative memory. But then there's the thing called episodic memory or autobiographical memory, and that's different. It's sort of remembrances of things from our past. The classic example of this is um, uh, Marcel Proust um, remembers of things past, where he takes his cup of tea and dips in a little pastry of madeleine, sips the tea, and then he's transported back to the streets in Dublin of his childhood. This is not something he deliberately recalled. It's something that just kind of happened. Now we can sometimes reflect on episodic memories. I think, oh yes, I remember the time in fifth fifth grade in elementary school, and then I can sort of wander there. So they often occur spontaneously, but they can also be somewhat recalled, not the same way as declarative memory. Now we have the two categories that you're really wanting to talk about, I think. And these are the implicit categories. And the first one is emotional memory or limbic memory, if you like. But then there's an even deeper form of memory, which is called procedural memory, sometimes called body memories. So the way that emotional memories emerge is that 
we meet somebody, we're introduced to somebody, and all of a sudden we feel anger or fear. I mean, this is somebody we've never met before. What's that about? Well, that's probably an emotional memory. Something about them, maybe their, their posture, the way they sit, the way they look, uh, if they have smoke on their breath or something like that, it triggers something from the past. And we have an eruption of this memory. Of where did it come from? Now, those things are always there underneath, ready to emerge. And they come sometime at the most inconvenient times. Uh, uh, somebody, you know, with, that I recently was working with, you know, every time uh, her uh, husband touched her, she would recoil and with fear and anger, tremendous anger. And of course, he didn't know where this anger was coming from. Well, then actually what we're able to do is move to the even lower level of memory or the more implicit less conscious form of memory, which are the procedural memories. And these are the things that the body learns. And usually we learn these things, well, in, in many examples, instances, we lear learn these memories very quickly. Example, riding a bicycle. You know, you do that with a parent or an older sibling and they're walking beside you, and then they let you go, and there you are riding the bike for the first time. And as the expression goes, it's something that we never really forget. And also it has to be learned pretty quickly because you can't, you don't have a lot of, you know, it's not like something you read from a book about riding a bike. The book won't do you any good. A book about skiing isn't going to really help you ski. Your body has to experience it and the body has to learn. So, so those are, uh, those are procedural memories, but a specific class is procedural procedural memories. And this is really, in a way, the fundamental axis of, of my book, Trauma and Memory, are the memories that have to do with threat and overwhelming threat, danger, threat, overwhelming threat, and helplessness and shutdown. These are profound global states that the nervous system and the body goes through. And what happens if we have been unsuccessful where we have been threatened and we were overwhelmed, well, that memory will become long lasting, sort of in the way that learning a bike becomes long lasting. These memories, they tend to be indelible, but they're not. But we have to know how to access them and the way to access those memories, really. And, and I think the only way to access those memories is through the body, through sensation. Because sensation is what connects us to motor action. Motor action coupled with other motor actions are what give rise to the procedural memory. So if, we're, if our body is responding to threat constantly, we have to actually complete this response so that it can clear it. You know, it, uh, otherwise it, it continues to linger. And that's, in a way, one of the fundamentals of somatic experiencing is how to work with these early imprints, these early procedural memories having to do with threat and danger and threat and, and mortal threat, mortal danger. So, again, it's only through sensation that we can move through these memories and then sequence them and then, in a way, put them back in the past where they belong also with the emotional memories. There's a, a field now, it's a very interesting field called reconsolidation theory. And basically when we go from a short-term memory to a long-term memory, uh, there are changes that occur in the synaptic connections between the brain. And so these, that happens in the synaptic vesicles and then in the dendrites and so forth. So there are molecular as well as morphological anatomical changes when short-term memory gets put into long-term memory. And that garnered a Nobel Prize uh, for uh, Eric Kandel. He's the one who did the seminal research on that. So then fast forward to, um, to Joseph Ledoux's laboratory. He's the one who's famous for the term the emotional brain. And so he had a student that wondered what would happen 
if when you remember something, you actually then in interrupted the consolidation. And Ledoux told his student, uh, well, you're, um, you're really wasting your time, but go ahead if you want, because you have these morphological changes in the structure and, the, and, and, and also the molecular changes. So anyhow, to shorten the story, he found that he would, when he was able to do that, he was able to erase the memory and even reinstall another memory. And it had to be done within a certain time of evoking the, the, the memory. Now, the key in somatic experiencing titration is that we don't overwhelm the person. We work with the trauma one small piece at a time. I call that titration. That's key. So if we can bring up the emotional memory or probably also the procedural memory in a state where the person is regulated enough so that they can experience it, they have enough distance, enough containment, so they can experience it without overwhelm, then you have that opportunity for literally the memory to change, to have a new memory. And again, this is what you see over and over in working with trauma that it's like the person now has a different memory where instead of feeling absolutely helplessness and overwhelmed, they felt some power and agency. So, um, so this, I think, is one of the reasons why when you're working with trauma, it's essential to work not exclusively, but primarily from the bottom up, from the level of sensation, from the level of emotional memory, and then to kind of move into more episodic, autographical, autobiographical memories. Yeah, I, I love that. Thank you. And, and I'm just going to play devil's advocate a little bit here for listeners who may not be as familiar or who are somewhat familiar, but um, may still have some reservations. One is when we're talking about regulation, um, we're talking about regulation of the nervous system. We're, you know, we we use sort of inside baseball terms like um, staying within a window of tolerance, or you know, sure. um, other other sort of more general terms might be like just being in balance or being calm, or you know, those kinds of things. But um, when you talk about sensation and the body, and it starts there from the bottom up, I know that even with some of my clients and and folks, people. Um, often have a very difficult time even understanding what noticing a sensation in their body would be yeah. when it's yeah. not so gross that it is a uh, gripping panic yeah. attack, for example. So how might someone, and again, often working with a provider who's able to work with you on this to contain, yeah. as you say, in a safe space, yeah. how would you begin to do that so you can start to titrate and unpack some of these traumatic memories. All right, let me get on to one thread of this, which is again, if people are not aware of even what sensations are, how do you bring them to, you know, to perceive their sensations and work with their sensations? And that's a very important point because a lot of times, not only traumatized people, but in our society, there's such a disembodiment, you know, a, a disconnection between head and body uh, that really is pervasive and really pervasive in our in our culture, and so, and and also with trauma, when a person first starts to sense sensations in their body, it, it to them it becomes like a harbinger of the overwhelming helplessness that they experience. So again, there's going to be an avoidance of the sensations. So first, what I might do is start with a very simple exercise here. And so I'll have the person uh, open their hand and then close it and then open it. And so you're looking at your hand while you're doing that, right? You can see that. Now, can you actually feel physically when your hand contracts like this and when it opens like that? That's it. And doing it slowly, just the way you're doing it sensing it physically now is there anywhere anywhere else in your body that you might want to experiment with that so a lot of times of course people have uh tension in their shoulders which is a residue of defending themselves of protecting themselves of this kind of startle reaction 
so I might, if there, if I see the the uh, tension in the shoulder or it kind of appears, I'll say, I'm just noticing your shoulders seem to be getting a little higher. I wonder what you're noticing there. Well, they feel really tight, I guess. Okay, well, okay. So now if you just actually allow them to get a little bit even more tense, what would the tension want to do? Well, it will usually want to lift the shoulders. So you can just allow the shoulders to lift just a little bit and then just let it down. Let's do that again together. Just bring in the shoulders up and down. And just notice what you're experiencing now. So this is now a completion of a procedural memory having to do with threat. Yeah, I love how we're doing this together, even through the electronic um, piece, because um, it's really the way that the mirror neurons and, and whatnot work when you're working with the clients. Um, yes. And 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 the and and just to you know really explain to folks, it's it's the ability to allow the body to do what it naturally wanted to do that it got stopped from being able yeah. to do when it yeah. was threatened when it perceived threat and um, allowing that to move through in a way that isn't overwhelming and, yeah. and how it's very different, this titration, dip a toe in the water kind of scenario, very different from the other kinds of um, things that people may know about, uh, like exposure therapy or something, that it's not that at all. Right, no, it's not, not, absolutely not. And, you know, and, and many therapies, well, all, I think all therapies could really benefit from some experience with somatic experiencing. Uh, I definitely, I mean, I think there are many therapies that are helpful. They may not do the whole thing because they're too much from here. But the one th therapy that I really, really have an issue with is this kind of prolonged exposure where people are made to relive their traumas over and over and over and over. There was a program on 60 Minutes, it's really quite horrendous, uh, of a, a program uh, where they were doing prolonged exposure with a number of Iraq and Afghanistan vets. And they would have to relive their traumas like six times a day. And you could see at the end of the program, they would just collapse. And it's really hard to watch. Now, I'm not saying some people, almost anything will help. But for with people who have more complicated trauma, just having them relive the traumas, especially, it's just gonna, not going to work. It's going to backfire. And if, if the person is overwhelmed, if they feel overwhelmed, it's really no different to the nervous system than when they were overwhelmed by the original trauma. So to me, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, again, you hopefully have somewhat of an observer there, but I, I just don't think it's a good idea, especially when there are such gentle, more gentle and effective ways to work with trauma, in my humble opinion. Yes, and I, <laughs> I, I concur. Um, I also know that um, a lot of this work about the nervous system, uh, talking about the social engagement system, as Dr. Stephen Porges has talked about, it's about safety, feeling safe. Yeah. Um, and that oftentimes with this sort of complex trauma or developmental trauma, childhood trauma, attachment sure. trauma, these things that are not um, equated to a car accident or a surgical um, miss, you know, misattunement or, or something like a natural disaster, oftentimes I feel as though they kind of go along like a slow current. They are not the tsunami, not that that isn't also traumatic, and that people often don't quite be able to put a name or a finger on how this is affecting them. And they interpret oftentimes the fact that they've learned adaptive strategies as them being bad, or a bad person, or there's shame around, why can't I change this or fix this? Sure. And your physiology is really kind of dictating a lot of this based on your early condition. So can you speak to sort of the narrative or the story that can go along with this and how even this kind of bottom-up work can separate out, like understanding how the physiology yeah. releases? Yeah. Well, let's talk again about early trauma, developmental trauma, attachment trauma, and so forth. 
if you um, the the children, babies and toddlers don't really fight or flight. They attach to objects of supposed safety. But what happens if the people that they attach to are also the people that are harming them or abusing them or humiliating them? It's, um, it, you, you could see the, the knot uh, that that produces. Um, see, uh, oh gosh, what, what was his name again? Anyhow, uh, so these you have to untangle more slowly. And they do show up in the relationship between the therapist and the client. But at the same time, you really still do use the same types of tools in SE that you would work with, with other trauma, but it's, you have to untangle it. And, and they have to find safety. And what you were talking about was Stephen Porges' work, my very, very dear friend, colleague. We've known each other for 40 years. And um, you know, he talks about the environment. So if the environment is safe, looks safe, appears safe, the person feels safe, that part of the nervous system, the social engagement system is turned on. When there's threat in the environment, we respond to threat by activating the sympathetic fight or flight nervous system. Then when we're experiencing mortal threat, life or death threat, then our nervous system shuts down in a particular way. But the, the reverse of this is even more true. So if our nervous system is in the state of shutdown, then we will experience everything out in the world as mortally dangerous. And this is what traumatized people go around with. Or whether we're stuck in the fight or flight response, then everywhere we see danger, we see threat. And when our nervous system, ideally, is in the social engagement, the ventral vagal, what Stephen Borges calls the myelinated vagus system, um, and you can read his, 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 his book. There's a, re a really good book that just came out a little while ago, Polyvagal Theory, Clinical Implications, something like that. Um, and um, uh, that should be the normal one. So in other words, if we're having an argument, you and I, Francesca, it's probably not going to help if we're yelling at each other and threatening each other. So we want to be able to say, you know, when you said that this was the time that we we're going to meet and you didn't show up you know i i really felt uh, I, I felt that you you didn't really care which of course is abandonment things there right that's underneath that is bad abandonment so um so anyhow so um where was i oh yeah yeah, yeah. so so we're, we're ideally in using the social engagement system. That's really the, the, the way with the, that we need to be as human cooperative uh, 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 organisms that are comprised of separate people. But we're always working together, collaborating. You see that, you know, if people are really impassioned about something and they are, um, they're doing it together with other people. They'll do that even though that doesn't pay that much. I mean, like the people who did Wikipedia, they did that basically for free. What a great resource that is. People really appreciated what they did. They're together. I mean, go into any restaurant. How many tables have one person? Very few. If you look at what their behaviors, what they're doing, is they're talking with each other, they're communicating with each other, they're gesturing with their other, with themselves. Uh, yeah. And um, so that's, um, that's really where we, our nervous system should be. But when we're traumatized, our nervous system is not there. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, that's the trauma shifts us out of our more natural calm state. And exactly. And this kind exactly. of work uh, tries to take us to the point of, 
where we were stopped or frozen so that we can allow the process of, um, uh, of releasing some of whatever is stuck to move through in a way so that we can restore more of that sense of calm or, or balance. And um, I just wanted to check in about the connection between how that calm or balance or sense of um, safety how trauma maybe can be a portal to a more spiritual kind of awakening, for lack of a better term, um, yeah. we could, you know, a, a deeper connection to all that is, whatever that's about. <laughs> right. Well, that's a complicated topic. And actually, I started addressing it in the, in the final chapter of In an Unspoken Voice. And I'm hopefully sooner or later going to be writing a book with a colleague of mine on spirituality and trauma. Beautiful. You know, first of all, the social engagement system is a type of spiritual uh, experience to really communicate with another person, to be with another person, to see another person as other and to understand the person as other. Uh, that's a spiritual aspect. Cooperation. Uh, uh, giving to other people, receiving gifts that we're given from other people. I mean, really, that's a wonderful heart experience, opening of the heart. And the heart chakra, of course, is key in many spiritual traditions. You know, Jack called, talks about uh, the path with a heart. That is a path. Also, the energies that are released in trauma are profound. The, the mobilization to fight or flee or even to shut down. These are also states that have aspects in spiritual experience. Um, the sympathetic nervous system can give rise to states of, of ecstasy. Sometimes this is seen as awakening of the kundalini energy. But in trauma, that energy has already been elicited, but it hasn't been able to complete and to to be assimilated into consciousness. So just working with those very energies can be a spiritual, is very often a spiritual dimension, opens the spiritual dimension. Now it's not the spiritual practice per se, but it does open the doors or it can open the doors. Then another aspect about it, and we've sort of been alluding to this, in working with sensations and really refining that work with sensations, um, that's, um, that's also something that, you know, is we see in, in, in Vipassana meditation and in Zen to really be present for experience moment to moment to moment. So again, another aspect of trauma transformation of the different gifts it can provide, the doors and access that it can allow us uh, as part of our healing. Uh, now, uh, kind of going around, in the other direction, that very often when people are, are meditating, and they'll meditate for a while, and, 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 and often people who are attracted to meditation are people who have had trauma in their lives. And anyhow, they're meditating, and they're getting some sense of peace, sort of, but then something happens, and all of a sudden, the trauma starts to flood up, right? the emotional memories, or images, or procedural memories, and the person doesn't really know what to do. So there are usually two things that happen. One is they deflect or they dissociate from the experience, and sometimes going into what's called the bliss bypass, or they just get stuck in the trauma itself. And uh, I was recently working with a monk uh, who had been meditating for 16 years, and then boom, all of a sudden he was overwhelmed by this childhood trauma of abuse. So what's happening in those 16 years with that kind of material? So he was becoming in some ways more dissociated and, and, and less embodied, more disembodied. So, um, so to, to really have an authentic experience in the meditation practice, we do need to in some ways address the, um, the trauma that's that that's that's also there in that consciousness territory and as you were mentioning that you were a student of jack cornfield uh you know for his teacher training 
he had them take at least the first year of our SE training. Oh, you were one of them. And then you got hooked. Got it. That's exactly right. That's <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Kept going. Yeah, right, right. So, so anyhow, we have to understand trauma to really enhance our meditative practice. And working trauma itself opens these different portals into, uh, into uh, spiritual dimensions, into a spiritual experience. It's wonderful, isn't it? Yeah it, yeah, it really is. And I so appreciate how beautifully you just connected all of that and shared that. And of course, it's, it's, it's grand and it's profound and it's unique for each person's experience. And yet, when there is a fundamental shift that does take place somehow, and it's met or held in a way that certain things are released or let go of, right it does somehow open up or create space to a new portal and a new way of being that enables us to relate to things as they arise differently. Yes. You know, there's a certain quality of spaciousness. When we're able to contain more and more of our sensations, we get more and more space really in our body. And that spaciousness also lets our look, lets ourselves look at these different images, at the different emotions, at these different sensations, to both be the experiencer and at the same time being the observer. And again, that's a state that's very much cultivated in various different uh, spiritual practices. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about how that works, where the cultivation of doing something somatic in some way, shape, or form as a regular sort of private practice can support perhaps some of the work that one might do along with a practitioner or a therapist or um, that, that they're both working with a physiological piece that's sort of um, not cognitive in that left brain. Sure. But- yeah. No, it's it's definitely not cognitive. And by the way, I am personally a fan of CBT, but you have to combine that with the bottom-up work of something like somatic experiencing. I mean, you just have to do that. It's not going to go, I mean, it's helpful, but it's only going to go a certain depth when you really need to go a lot, lot deeper. So, um, and the other thing is, if I understand your question correctly, is that we um, that we also uh, when we also want to help our clients develop their own capacity to work with these sensations when they arise, uh, and then again it, it becomes sort of like a practice because if they only are relying on the therapist, and of course they do because we know things of course that they don't do. It's like when you go to a doctor. He knows things or she knows things that we don't know because he's had that training. So, you know, there, there is that element. But really, for people to begin to work with these sensations and feelings when they come up by having a big enough container and being able to stand back and observe them. You know, there's a, a short documentary that was made uh, with um, a man named Ray, a Marine who was blown up by two IEDs. And it's on YouTube. It's open, open access. And I think it's called Ray's Story, Somatic Experiencing with Peter Levine, something like that. And um, at the end, we, we do four sessions, and then he comes to Esalen, where I do a, a class called The Ordinary Miracle of Healing. So they gave him a scholarship so he could be there for that five days. And um, at the end of the session, he was going outside, and he came to my uh, technical assistant and my technical assistant said, oh, do, would you mind doing a little interview? So anyhow, Ray starts by saying, well, you know, when I did that session with Dr. Levine in Los Angeles, um, I thought this was the biggest wad of, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> said, but then I realized that maybe I was stopping myself. And then I realized that I could also use the tools that he gave me to be able to use them in my life. And he was extremely traumatized with many, many, many different symptoms. And you see how he goes from being really horrendously affected, debilitated, 
to a real human reflecting, uh, really a very special, sensitive human being. I just heard recently that he was on the dean's list at the, his college where he was studying computer science. Beautiful. Yes. I really, really, it, and it's it's really worth to look at that video. It gives you somewhat of a feeling of somatic experiencing. It's free, so. Yeah, no, it's beautiful, and and I and another part of the story um, for those not to be a spoiler alert, but um, you know he finds himself into relationship and and child and and, yes. and you know that that out of that um, so traumatic experience um, while serving in war came forward to to connect uh, in the end through this healing process and, um, and now is flourishing in ways and and that's really sort of what I try to emphasizes so much of our lives we've gone from surviving uh we're, we're just sort of holding on surviving and yeah. we want to get to whatever we think happiness is which might be thriving which i think is ultimately thriving but we forget about this sort of middle tier sometimes about the stabilizing or the unpacking mm. you know it's sort of like we have to dig out or dig down or go you know be willing to go back a little bit but then we have to kind of stay steady for a little bit and kind of get familiar mm -hmm. with that before we can start building up. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um, yeah. Again, this is really a lot about learning to have greater containment. So it's not, it's not that the emotions are too powerful or too intense. It's that our container isn't big enough. So it seems more intense. So think about a sensation or an emotion that, you, that you're afraid of. So when it starts to come up, you push down and you try to hold it down. But you know the expression, that which we resist persists. So the sensation or the emotion keeps pushing back. And then we push down even more. And then it feels like if we ever let go, we'll be completely overwhelmed. But the reason it feels like we're being overwhelmed, again, is because we haven't, been, haven't developed yet the capacity to contain, to have enough space, inner, interceptive, physical, emotional space in the body to contain those, those, those difficult sensations and emotions. And then, and only then, are we able to look at them observe them, process them, and as I said before, then put them back in the past where they belong. So this capacity to contain is central in, 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 in somatic experience. Sometimes people confuse containing with suppressing, and they're completely different. Suppressing is more holding it down. Containing is saying, okay, I can open a space so that you can live in me and I can be with you and I can visit with you and I can learn from you and I can begin to heal more deeply. Yeah, that is so beautiful. <laughs> that level of curiosity and that we bring to our experience as opposed yeah. to fear and, and, uh, and avoidance is, is so key. The last question I wanted to ask before we close is a little bit of a bigger one, but kind of more something that Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, when I was talking to him last week, sort of was um, speaking of. And that's sort of like um, certain populations really have like difficult, big, sustained trauma. So we're talking about like the isms. Right, the racism, poverty, you know, those yeah. kinds of things. And he was saying about in the south side of Chicago, you know, um, a certain kind, you know, someone who is in that environment, in a traumatic environment. And yeah, sure. He, and he was saying that certain people can access therapies and modalities that can be healing, yeah. but maybe other people can't. So I don't know if there's anything that can be said about that that might be helpful. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, look, when you're in a war zone, you're in a war zone and you don't want to process your traumas because you want to do everything you can to stay alive. And uh, although even even there, even processing some of this would make people could make people more resilient. But but still, when you're under a situation where there is so much in Stephen Ford Jay's terms, threat and mortal threat all around you you know, all the time, and you don't know when 
it's going to happen. It leaves also a lot of uncertainty. So, so um, uh, we do have to also look at this as a social issue. Uh, the other thing that is that what occurs a lot in these populations in poverty and um, I, actually, in the, I just finished a workshop at Esalen last week, and there were two wonderful young uh, young men and a young woman there. One was a crow, and the other is a um, was a Navajo lady. And we actually did a session together with the two of them, the three of us, the two of them, and we worked with their generational trauma because again, that's one that that most therapists really don't appreciate and or know how to work with of course are the effects that our parents 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 are going down the line and it's not only uh, trauma that's being passed on from generation to generation but great gifts and so in this session they connected also with the deep wisdom of their ancestors and we have a lot to learn with so-called primitive or primary people uh, you know, who see that as the re their reality. Um, one of my one of my Brazilian teachers, wonderful woman named Ethel. Uh, she is a uh, a nun from Tanzania, and so she really still has a lot of her tribal wisdom with her in her essay work. And she again, she almost always works with the generational aspects because they're there. They're very very powerful, and they're very often specific. I can give you an example. Uh, at one time, I was working with a number of people, and in the sessions, they would report experiencing the smell, a nauseating smell of burning flesh. And a number of them were vegetarian, so it just didn't make any sense. Well, then, as I started to question them more, they had grandparents and even parents who were in the Holocaust. So I say, wait a minute, how can that specific smell be transmitted? I know it, I believe it because I see it. You know, I, that's their experience. There's, so then uh, uh, a few years ago, I came across this article. Uh, it was, um, it was a, 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 an ex set of experiments done with mice. So they would expose mice to a whiff of cherry blossom. So that's either pleasant or at least neutral. They, they don't have any negative response. But then if you start to pair it, scent of, uh, of cherry blossom with a shock, and you do that for a couple of weeks, then when they smell the cherry blossom, they automatically freeze and tremble and defecate. And so clearly they are now having a conditioned response. There's nothing unusual about that. It's expected. It's a Pavlovian conditioned response. However, and I don't know why they did this experiment, but they must have been they must have been somehow channeling what I was thinking. And anyhow, they 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 had they, seven generations of mice, or five generations, five generations for that matter. And so when they took the great 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 grandchildren of those parents that were exposed to the shock to the smell. When they expose them to that neutral smell, remember this is many generations later, they went exactly into the same response, even more so, they froze, they trembled, they defecated. Wow, and it was only to that scent, not to other scent. So these specific things are transmitted. Again, that was the, the last chapter in uh, Trauma and Memory was really looking at these mechanisms not only of how trauma, but of how great wisdom and life-saving wisdom can be passed on from generation to generation. Yeah, that's that's so beautiful because, I mean, I'll just share this. Um, there's another complex trauma training that I'm in called Indigenous Oriented Focusing Therapy oh. that uses um, Eugene Gendlin's approach and Shirley sure. from Canada. Um, and they're combining, as you say, this indigenous, aboriginal, uh, mm -hmm. First Nation people's wisdom here mm -hmm. with yeah. um, with these uh, trauma uh, healing methods, doing just as you described, tapping into the medicine 
in that orientation sure. called the wisdom that is mm -hmm. also, and the resilience and how so many of these modalities aren't um the the the, the tribal the shamanic you know that sure. are not valued in our society today yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, when I was developing somatic experiencing, I was very careful not to talk about shamanism or anything like that, because, you know, it took quite a while for it to be accepted. And now that we have, you know, uh, 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 controlled uh, uh, outcome studies and so forth, I feel a little bit more willing to talk and to honor shamanism. Because uh, therapists, not all therapists, but many therapists are healers. And that's a shamanic tradition. It really is. It's also a psychological, uh, you know, practice, but it's also a shamanistic practice. And um, I, I, by the way, I'd love if you would give me that, send me that information. I will. I would just really appreciate that. And again, sometimes life-saving information comes ancestors let me give you just a couple of quick examples and then i guess we're, we'll call it wrap up yeah. wrap, do a wrap um i was working with this woman that there was a plane that that went from denver this was back 89 i think 90 i don't know sometime around then and to chicago and an engine exploded and and uh destroyed all of the hydraulic lines so there was no way to control the plane so the pilots uh, tried to control it by making one engine faster than the other engine. It was an almost impossible task. They did land, but the plane broke up into pieces, and then there were explosions, fireballs. So I'm working with this one uh, young woman, Katie, and uh, she experiences herself a uh, somatic memory, a procedural memory, of being upside down. And she was, and she she has the memory of opening the belt and then letting herself down and everything being black and starting to be smoked. So she sees a pinpoint of light and she starts crawling to the, towards the light because she hears the words, go to the light, go to the light. And it was the words of both her father and her grandfather. Both had survived airline crashes, one military, one commercial, by crawling to the light. So you can say, well, they told you the story, but why did that just happen in that moment? In the, in the uh, tsunami, we did some work in the South Asian tsunami, it, right when the earthquake happened, the elephants and other wild animals and tribes people immediately went up to the hill uh, to, you know, to, and they were saved. So you could say, well, okay, the elephant, well, you know, the tribal people, you could say, well, they tell stories. Remember, the last time this happened was 300 years ago. So, okay, that's certainly possible. Uh, but the elephants? So somehow, again, that generational procedural memory was there, which said, escape this way, don't stay around. So it's an incredible interesting field and, and one I hope to do more research and maybe more writing about. Yes, I would love to hear about this new book that's coming up. Um, but in the meantime, this has been such a beautiful conversation and I'm so honored that we had the chance to spend this time together today. Um, it really has been a gift and um, I encourage everyone to pick up if they would like the latest trauma and memory brain and body in a search for the living past and or any of other Dr. Levine's books. You can read all about him on the website. I will also add your links there. Let me mention one other thing. I've just started working on a book on healthy uh, sexuality for adolescents because that is such an insane mess. Again, in our culture, it's uh, so dehumanizing and this disconnecting, disconnecting. So I hope we'll have some time to work on that. And then the other thing I'm working on is because I've worked in the past with thousands of people with fibromyalgia, irritable bowel, migraine, those kind of symptoms. They're sometimes called medically undiagnosed symptoms. And there are probably at least 20 million people in the U.S. alone suffering from those kind of symptoms. So there's not enough therapists to work with that population. So I'm actually working on a online program, an app with um, to, with an entrepreneur and two MIT scientists uh, to, to make this program that people can get the help 
with these kind of conditions online. So those are my passions during the next while. Yeah, amazing. All right. Well, we have those to look forward to. And again, healthy sexuality for adolescents. How wonderful that you're even opening up that conversation because for so many, it is just not only confusing and yes, it's just, yes. And what a gift. Um, I, I know you have other things to do. We could talk all day, but maybe I can have you on again when we can talk about healthy okay. adolescent sexuality. Okay. <laughs> Thank all you. right. Dr. You bet. I enjoyed our conversation. Take care. Bye-bye, Francesca. Bye-bye now.